Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video we're going to be doing a very simple prototype game inside of Godot 4.2, and we're going to be using pure C Sharp scripting in order to do it. So we're going to be going step by step to basically recreate this exact demo you see here. So we have a uh, cannon we can charge up that has a power level associated with how long you press and hold the fire button. And if we get it into the scoring zone, then we score a point. And so these functions are using rigidbody 2Ds, simple Godot physics, and we control all of that through our C Sharp scripts. So here I have Godot 4.2 release candidate one, the mono version. So I'm pretty sure for this tutorial, you would be able to work with any 4.0 plus version, just make sure that your Godot is uh, the mono version so that it supports C Sharp. So I'm going to go back to the project list. So back in the project list, let's create a brand new one for our tutorial. So I'm going to do a new project. I'm going to navigate to where I want to put our project. So I'll use my tutorials folder. I'll select this. It'll give us a project name. So I'll call this project something like projectile prototype CS for C sharp. And I'll create the folder. But we have no need for advanced graphics. So I'm just going to stick it to mobile and hit create and edit. Okay, so this project's 2D. So I'm just going to jump into 2D view immediately. And then let's start by creating a 2D scene. I'm going to rename this and call it world. And let's save world to our project. So I'll just save it in the root for now. And the main function of this project is creating a projectile launcher. So I'm going to want to create a separate scene for a launcher and put it inside of our game world. So I'll click on add a new scene over here, 2D scene. And we can rename this route to be projectile launcher. And then I'll right click here, add a child node. We'll get a sprite 2D node. And then I'll drag Iconda SVG into this, which is the default Godot icon. So it works okay for prototyping and this kind of stuff. So now let's take this projectile launcher and save it to our project. So if we're going to have a bunch of different objects in our scene, we probably want to organize it into a folder. So let's create a folder. I can call it objects. Okay, okay. Inside of objects, we'll just say projectile launcher.tscn inside of there. So now with that saved, we can go over to world, uh, expand the objects folder in the file system, and drag projectile launcher into here, which basically puts an instance of our projectile launcher scene straight inside of the game world. So you can jump into saved scenes to edit them by clicking on this little edit button. And now we're back in the projectile launcher scene. So out here, this is an instance, and then inside the scene, that we're editing, this is the main thing. So if you change stuff in here, it's going to affect everything outside of it, unless those are overwritten. Our projectile launcher isn't going to do anything until we give it a script. So let's click on the attach script button. And we have the option of choosing a language. So for language, we want to choose C sharp. Now for C sharp scripts, I've noticed that generally, you take the uh, name of the script and you make it Pascal case. So we would have projectile launcher with a capital P, a capital L, and no underscore. Generally in Godot, you would use snake case where you'd have lowercase and then underscores to separate them. Uh, but this seems to be the exception for C Sharp. So we're going to save this. Um, we can put it in the same folder as our projectile launcher scene. Later, we can organize things into further separated directories inside of here. Uh, but let's create this script. Okay, so we have our projectile launcher script. Now for me, it automatically opened up in Visual Studio Code. So now we can start talking about one of the main differences between coding in CS and then coding in GD script, which is that with CS, you're going to want to use an external editor. There's lots of support for C Sharp and other IDEs, such as Visual Studio Code or Visual Studio. But in Godot, the script editor here, the built-in one, is almost exclusively just for doing GD script editing. So you're going to need an external editor for your C sharp code. Uh, you can go ahead and get that set up on the side and then come back to the tutorial. I will kind of show my settings here for what I have set up in editor editor settings. So the main setting here that I think is relevant down here at the bottom for .NET editor is that you choose the external editor and then you choose the one you want. So in my case, that's Visual Studio Code. And this means that for a .NET or C sharp code, that your editor of choice is Visual Studio Code. And I think that's what makes it automatically open up C Sharp's code in this external editor. Or up at the top, I do also have for text editor external, these settings here, the, the path here for uh, Visual Studio Code on my computer, and then execution flags, um, basically showing Visual Studio Code where to open it up. But I don't have use external editor checked here, so I don't think that's actually 
affecting anything at the moment. So what you really just need is to set external editor visual studio code. Now that will mean that when you double click on a CS file, it's going to open it up in uh, visual studio code, and then you can edit it here. So if you're going to be doing C sharp scripting inside of visual studio code, you're going to want in extensions. I'll just uh, search Godot here. You're going to want C sharp tools for Godot. So this plugin helps you with code completion, launching games directly from Godot editor, and um, supposedly helping you set up the debugging. But the debugging setup I'm using right now that actually works for 4.2 is a little different than the default they set up here. So maybe the debugging will work out of the box at a future date for 4.2. Um, but for right now, if you go to run and debug and you do create a launch JSON file for C Sharp Godot, then this will create in your project under the VS Code directory, launch and tasks.json. So tasks.json shows how to build your C Sharp scripts so that they can be used in your game. And then launch.json is how we're opening the editor and launching the game. So I'm not actually going to be using these default settings. Instead, on uh, GitHub, I was looking around a few days ago, and I found Kuno Saho's post where uh, we have an actual working launch.json and task.json file. So I'm going to basically copy these into uh, the launch and task.json in our project. And hopefully this will allow us to get working with debugging in Godot. So no joke, I found that the most frustrating part of C Sharp Godot is just getting um, the debugger to work with the latest versions of Godot Mono C Sharp. So I have the direct link to this post in the description of the video. So you can go here and basically just copy paste into your project. So launch.json, I'm going to copy this. We're going to go to our launch.json. I'm going to select everything and press Control V to paste in what we copied. Save it. And then tasks.json, I'm going to go here, control C, we go to tasks.json, select everything, control V, paste it in. So under tasks, we can see workspace folder slash the name of our project. So uh, what is the name of our CS project file? Well, that's down here in our project explorer, project prototype CS.CS project. So we just put that name in here, Pro uh, projectile prototype CS.CS project. Save the tasks.json. One more thing we do need to change in order for our launch configuration to work is to put in the path for uh, the program for Godot. So I'm going to um, just copy and paste in here the path to my Godot executable. So wherever you have your current version of Godot installed, the one you're using to edit the C Sharp project right now, uh, copy and paste the path here. If you're on Windows, you might need to change the backslashes to forward slashes. Aside from that, if you're pointing to a Godot 4 plus mono version, then we should be good to go, I think. Okay, now if we hit Control Shift D to go to our run and debug tab, dot core launch console here. Uh, by the way, if you didn't already know, you do want to have a version of the .NET SDK installed on your computer so that you can actually uh, run, build, and debug. So right now, the main versions of .NET SDK that are supported for Godot are 6.0 and 7.0, and I think 8.0 is also supposed to work. So if you go to your search engine and you search .NET SDK 7.0 and you download it from uh, Microsoft.com, just grab the version that's uh, corresponding with your computer. So for me, that would have been Windows x86 for 64-bit Windows. Download that, install it, and everything else should work from there. Um, so to test that we can actually hit the breakpoints, I have the projectile launcher script and we have the ready function. So you can notice ready in process. It's the same thing as GD script Godot. Ready code executes when a node is ready, it's in the scene. So we could do something here like, um, let's say gd.print and I will say ready. So what I'm accessing right here is uh, the GD global functions. So when you want to do stuff like print errors, print uh, warnings or print to the GD console or Godot console, then you can use the GD global object. So I'm going to print ready to the console when our projectile launcher script is ready. I'm also going to go over here, add a debug breakpoint, and then we're going to run the debugger. So now that we have a breakpoint set and we have the ready function, I'm going to control shift D to go back over to the debug tab and hit run on our project. So the project's going to build here. And if everything goes well, then it would launch. But we can see that we have not set a main scene defined in the project. So uh, let's go back out to Godot and do that really quickly. So we have our world scene, 
But I actually want to have another layer above world. So I'm going to call that my gameplay scene. And that'll hold base nodes. It'll hold our 2D world, but it will also hold the UI. And this is just how I like to structure uh, my projects at the moment. But you can kind of change up your uh, final game node structure to be however you want. But uh, let's create a new scene here. And I'm going to call it an other node. So just a basic node. I'm going to rename this to be gameplay. I'm going to save this to our project gameplay.tscn and if you wanted this to be a 2d node you could if you want the top node to have position in the game world rotation and stuff like that but i didn't find it necessary so i'm just using a base node and we can drop world.tscn into here and then we have our game world which of course the game world has a projectile launcher and we can jump further into there to edit our projectile launcher so just scenes stacked into different scenes so from here, now we have our main gameplay scene. Let's go to project, project settings, and application run. We want to set the main scene here to gameplay.tscn. So now that we set a main scene in our project, we can run and debug again. So I'm going to run for the .NET Core launch here, which should open the game hopefully. Now you can see I'm still not hitting the breakpoint. And the reason for that is because if we check Godot, you can see that I don't actually have the script attached. So very silly, you got to make sure Projectile Launcher CS is put in the script part of the inspector. So now that it's there, we should be able to save, uh, go back to Visual Studio Code, run it, and hopefully we should hit this GD print ready um, debug point. And there you can see that we're hitting the debugger point. So basically in a nutshell, copy and paste the launch.json, replace the program with the path to your Godot version, paste in the tasks.json file as well, then create a C sharp script, set a breakpoint, and launch the run and debug from Visual Studio Code. And hopefully that will get it working for you. So getting this far can really be a pain. Uh, once again, I'll put the GitHub link where um, Kuno Saho posted his settings, which are super helpful. And hopefully you guys can get that far. And from there, we can actually start the real tutorial. Okay, so let's remove the breakpoint and I'm gonna remove GD print ready. Uh, let's go back to Godot engine. And then before we actually start with coding, I'm going to go to world and we're going to put in some ground and a camera. So I'm going to right click on world. Let's add a child node. We'll do a camera 2D to start. And this camera, I'm going to say that the bottom of the ground is also the zero Y position here. So the camera, I want to limit it to a left of zero and a bottom of zero. So what this means is that the camera can never go to the left of this point or below the zero bottom at least by default for our purposes. So when we're building our tiles, they'll always be above this zero line. Now let's go to world, add child node, and we'll do a tile map. So our tile map allows us to basically add tiles on a grid. So let's create a tile set for our tile map. In the inspector, tile set, click here, new tile set. Let's expand. I'm also gonna do physics layers, add element. This will later mean that we'll be able to have collisions when our rigid bodies hit the tiles. So the ground will actually work as ground. And then let's open up at the bottom of the screen, tile set so that we can set the tiles and then tile map is to place the tiles. So tile set, we're going to drag icon SVG over to tiles. But before I do that, uh, this has a pixel size of 128, 128, I think. So we'll just make the tile size in our tile map. 128, 128 for X and Y. Now when we drag icon SVG over here and uh, we have the auto create, we can just hit yes, which will give us one tile, which is what we want. And let's go to paint and we can add the physics layer to this tile, which will make the ground work as actual ground. So let's do paint properties, select a property editor, uh, physics layer zero. And then I'm going to take this square. I'm just going to left click on our tile. And there we have a ground tile. So let's go to tile map and I can select our tile, then the pencil tool, and we can just press wherever we want to have ground inside of our game. So I'm just gonna left click, hold and drag, and we'll have some ground tiles here, just because. But you can see that these ground tiles, because we're using the same sprite as the projectile launcher, kind of conflict here. So for tile set, let's also add in a paint property of modulate. So let's change the color on this tile. And you can just set the modulate color to whatever you want. So I might go with like a purple kind of color here and left click on the tile. 
and that will uh, adjust the color tile. Basically, you're taking the base colors and you're multiplying it by this modulate color. And that's a cheap way you can prototype some ground tiles reusing the same assets, I suppose. And in reality, for your real game, you'd probably want an artist-designed tile set with nice-looking ground. But this will work for right now. Uh, so let's take the projectile launcher. I'm going to select it. I'm going to hit W to go to move mode. And I'm going to just position it uh, somewhere around here above the ground. Now if we run our project, we should see the camera showing uh, basically what's in the box right there. So we have our ground tiles, we have our projectile launcher. Now everything's a little bit small. So uh, what you might want to do is uh, go to project window, project settings, and let's expand the window size. So I might say uh, 1440 by 880. I think that's still like a 16 by 9 resolution. And if we hit play now, we should be able to see a little bit more inside of our game. Yep, okay. So bigger viewport means we can see more stuff in here. So our projectile launcher, we want it to always point at the mouse. Now, uh, this script is going to be getting the mouse position uh, based on the position of the projectile launcher. And so what I've noticed is that the rotation of a node can mess around a little bit with the uh, getting the angle to a location, like the mouse pointer. So uh, rather than adjusting the projectile launcher 2D node's rotation directly. Later, we're going to add a sub node here, add child node. So I'll say node 2D, and then we'll make the sprite a child of this. So I could rename this and call it something like transform adjustment. And now our projectile launcher script can adjust this node's transform, rotation, etc., without affecting the base node's rotation and transform. So everything cascades down in Godot. So if we have a sprite 2D node that's a child of transform adjustment, that's node 2D, then the node 2D here, if this rotates, the sprite under it is also going to rotate. Okay, and I think it was calling this aiming in uh, the other project, which I think is a little bit better of a name. So I'll call it the aiming node. Now let's finally jump into the script again and actually start editing our C sharp. Sorry, it took a while to get to that point, but now that we have everything set up, uh, it should be pretty smooth sailing from here. So inside of the script, we want to put a export variable, export meaning we expose it to the inspector over here, and then we'll be able to set it. And so what we're going to set is the node 2D for aiming, so that we can access this aiming node inside of our projectile launcher script, even though the aiming node is uh, on a different location than the projectile launcher. So in our script, we're going to put in square bracket export. In GD script, you would do at export for your variables. So same concept, just a little bit different in its syntax. And then we're going to do public node 2D, which is the node type. And then we'll give this property a name, aiming. And I'll say git semicolon, and I'm going to say private set semicolon. Okay, so let's walk through this real quick. So public here refers to the accessibility of our aiming property. And public means that we can access it from an external script, an external class. So if we want other classes to be able to access the projectile launcher's uh, properties, we would make it public. Um, then this here right now is the type of property. So it's a Godot class, Node2D. And here we have the property name. So note that in C Sharp, you make properties uh, capital for the first letter. If it was a field, you would make it lowercase for the first letter, and then camel casing from there for fields. And then here you have the getter and setters of the property. So a getter function gets the backing field, and a setter function sets the backing field. We have not created something like private node 2D underscore aiming. So this can be a backing field if we were to create a custom getter and setter function. But if we're not going to have any custom code run when we get or set a property, then that's unnecessary and we can just use a automatic backing field. So unless we specify our custom getter or custom setter function, this part here of having a field is actually just automatic. So all you really need is this. Now, why would I make the setter function here private? Well, that's because I don't want other scripts to be able to set this uh, property value to basically change what the aiming script is. So if I make this a private setter, then only the projectile launcher script or in the inspector, our uh, game editor, is going to be able to mess with or change the aiming node. So basically once the game starts, 
and we're looking from other scripts, we can only get this property, we can't set it. So this is a pretty significant difference from GD script, where uh, you can say that a field is private by saying like underscore aiming, but the underscore doesn't do anything. It only implies that a field should be private. Your GD scripts can still actually grab private variables and change them however they wish. The underscore is just supposed to be a convention where you respect that. But in C sharp, it's actually hard coded in. So if something is private, you actually just cannot mess with it from another class. So you can kind of think of C sharp as a lot more hard coded. Once you hit the build button and you run it, things can't be messed with or changed. If you expect an object of a certain type, it actually has to be that object. If something is private, it's actually private and it can't be messed with. But a lot more things in GD script are kind of more implied as, um, as more of like a Python type scripting language. So you can also see that methods or functions inside of a class also work like that in C sharp. Uh, there's also a third accessibility keyword protected, which means that if a class inherits from this child class of like project launcher, then it can override or it can call a protected function. So those are your three types, protected, public, and private. So let's actually do the aiming now. Uh, this bit right here, I just had that uh, off camera for simple testing, but um, we can get rid of that. Okay, so we have our aiming property here. Uh, we go back over to Godot, and if you don't see the aiming property show up here, click on the build button in the top right, and you should be able to assign the aiming property, and we'll assign this to any node 2D, but the one we want is aiming here. Okay, now when we actually use aiming inside of our script, it should be able to get this value here, and we can use it inside of our script. So for the aiming node, we want to set its rotation to uh, basically point at wherever our mouse position is. So the node we're going to be rotating is the aiming node. So let's say aiming dot rotation. So this, uh, we need to set it to a number of radians. So we can get the number of radians of rotation from uh, various angle functions. So if we say get angle two, and we pass in a position here, then we can get the angle from our projectile launcher to the mouse position. But first we have to get the mouse position. So I'll create a vector two variable and we'll say mouse position. Because this is just a variable and not a property, it's a camel case, which means the first letter is lowercase and then following words have the first letter capitalized. So we're going to set that equal to and get uh, mouse position, we want get global mouse position. And that's a function. So we call it. So this is going to save our vector two position of the mouse over here. Now I can take this field name and use it as an argument for get angle two. And then end the line with a semicolon, you basically always have to end C sharp lines with semicolon. So now let's run and debug our project. And if all goes well, we should have our rotation point at wherever the mouse is. So you can see the rotation is following the mouse around the screen. However, it's uh, not exactly pointing the right way. The rotation is working, but you can see that the sprite is always kind of angled, um, kind of like 90 degrees to the left of where we want it. I'd kind of rather have the head be pointing out wherever the mouse is. So to fix that, let's go into Godot. Let's take the sprite 2D node and let's set the transform rotation to 90. Let's see if that works. Yeah, okay, that should be fine. And now let's run the game again and our mouse pointer. Now we can see the head is pointing at wherever the mouse position is. So that's good. That's uh, basically all we need to do for the aiming part. Now that our projectile launcher can rotate towards where we're going to be shooting, uh, let's actually create a projectile inside of the Godot editor. So I'm going to create a new scene. I'll create a 2D scene here. I'm going to rename it to be projectile. Let's save it in our project. I'll save it in objects. So projectile.tscn. So our projectile is going to need a sprite 2D node. Let's create that. I'll just drag and drop icon SVG as the sprite. We'll just keep reusing that here. But if you have your own assets you want to use, feel free to replace any of these with uh, anything you'd like if you have an arrow sprite or something. And uh, our projectile base node is actually needing to be a rigid body 2D. Or we need to have a rigid body 2D if we want to apply physics somewhere in our projectile scene. So let's uh, right click here and change the type to a rigid body 2D. So this is going to mean that we'll be able to apply uh, force vectors to our projectile to make it move in the physics engine. 
However, we'll have a little warning here that you have to have a collision shape in order for the projectile to interact with other objects. So let's right click here. I'm going to add a child node collision shape 2D, hit enter, and our collision shape 2D needs a shape resource. So go over to inspector shape and let's create a new circle shape. So I'm going to leave this circle shape uh, very small, um, just so that when our object moves in the scene, that it won't necessarily bump into other projectiles as easily. We'll just have a really small one down here in the center area. Another way you can uh, keep your projectiles from interacting with each other would be that you go to projectile and then you can put them on different layers that don't mask with each other. So if you have like uh, layer two projectiles and then I think if you don't have mask layer two, then this object won't collide with other objects on layer two. But I'm just going to keep it really simple here and everything's just on layer one. Um, and the way we'll prevent the collision is just by having a small collision shape here. And maybe we do want the projectiles to collide with each other. We just don't want them to um, like knock each other off the screen so easily, so to speak. We might want to assign a script to the projectile. Right now we're not going to do much with it, but uh, what we can do is make the projectile a certain class within our game. So it's not just a rigid body 2D, but it's a projectile. Um, and that means that we can filter uh, other objects based on collision, checking to make sure that a projectile is a projectile type before we allow things like scoring in the game. So later when we have a scoring area, we only score if it's a projectile that entered that area, not if it was a um, any other rigid body 2D. So let's add a projectile script. And I'm going to save that in the objects folder. I'm going to rename it to be capital P projectile.cs. And it will inherit from rigid body 2D. That's fine. So let's create that. Uh, for now, we're not going to need the ready and process function, so I'll cut those out. I'll just hit Control S here. So the only thing this class is going to do is basically give it a little tag of being a projectile type. So it's still a rigid body 2D, but now it's also a projectile, since this is the final class that inherits from rigid body 2D. So let's save that. So now let's go back to projectile launcher, open up this script here, and in order to instance a projectile in the game we need to give it a packed scene to create an instance of a projectile from. So let's export a new property, export, and I'll say public uh, packed scene. So a packed scene, we don't know what the internal type is um, from a packed scene. A packed scene is just a resource pointing to a location on our computer that contains the scene we want to instantiate. Um, so you can check what the type is at uh, instantiation time really quickly. But for right now, it's just a packed scene, and we expect it to be a projectile scene. So our packed scene is going to be called a projectile scene. And we'll do a git private set. We make it private set so that we can't just mess with the packed scene from other classes. We want to just set that in the inspector and be done with it, at least for now. And you can always change later on and just remove the private if you have a legitimate reason for other classes accessing it later on. So now let's go back to Godot. Uh, let's um, click on projectile launcher, build our script, and we should see the new property pop up here, projectile scene. So this is a resource. If we click here, uh, we're going to need a packed scene resource. So we can quick load and then select the projectile.tscn scene from our project. And now we have the scene to instantiate in our game. So now that we have our projectile scene assigned, we can jump back into Visual Studio Code. And we're going to want to instantiate a copy of this projectile scene when we press a button. So pressing a button is considered an event inside of Godot. So the function we want to override, which is you take the base function and you create your own version of it, is going to be input. So down here at the bottom, we want to add a new method or a function within a class. And we're going to do public override because we're overriding a virtual function. And that's going to be void underscore input. So you can see input takes a input event as a parameter and that event can be many different types of events so uh, i'll hit enter here to complete the uh, function and inside of this we can check to see what event triggered such as a action button being pressed down and so we'll create a uh, shooting action and when that shooting action is pressed then we will fire the projectile or later we'll start charging the projectile until the button is released again, in which case we'll actually finish the firing of the projectile. So we don't need this uh, base input, because I believe that actually does nothing. Uh, what we do want to check, though, is if the event, and we'll say dot is action pressed. So here we need a string name of the action we're checking. And that can really arbitrarily be whatever string name you want to 
put in. So you could say quotation shoot if you want, and then we create the shoot action inside of the Godot input action mapping. But a better way, I think, to do it would be to come up here at the top and give a new export variable. So at export, and we'll say public string name, string name implying it's a name that isn't going to change. And we'll say shoot action, which will be a git private set. So we definitely don't want to change the shoot action from other classes, I think. And we can have this default to, let's say, shoot. Or if you prefer lowercase, you can do that as well. So our shoot action, we'll put uh, the property down here, shoot action. And now in place of the string, we're using the property to get whatever we set up here. And because it's an export, that means we can customize it in the inspector if we have a reason to change it from its default. So if the action is pressing of the shoot action button, then we'll add in curly braces to wrap the if statement. So if that's true, everything inside of here is going to execute. And what we're going to want, at least for now, is going to be a shoot projectile, which will be a new function that we will create right now. So public void shoot projectile. And so up here, we created a projectile scene, which is just one projectile we could shoot from a launcher. But maybe in the future, there'd be different types of projectiles we'd want. So we can put a parameter in here for a packed scene. So I'll say packed scene projectile scene then we'll have our function. So instead of uh, directly instantiating our property, we will instantiate whatever is passed into here. And so when we call shoot projectile, we'll pass in our uh, projectile scene up there at the top, projectile scene. So maybe the naming here between the property and this parameter is a little too similar. So I could rename this something like projectile to shoot, um, just to kind of differentiate them a bit. And so we're going to create a instance of the packed scene, but we actually want to uh, give the instantiate a typing. So we're going to be instantiating a projectile. And if we aren't creating a projectile because the packed scene set here is not correct, then we want it to throw some kind of error message because something went wrong in our setup. So I'll say here projectile instance, or maybe we say projectile instance is equal to projectile to shoot, which is the packed scene. And we're going to say dot instantiate. Now you'll see that compared to the GD script version of instantiate, that you also have the option of calling it with these less than greater than symbols. So if we do instantiate with this, we can put in a type here. And the type we want is projectile. We created that earlier in our projectile script. And so we're instantiating an object with a type of projectile. So this instantiate method is going to create an instance of this object and it's going to try to assign it as a projectile, which will be valid over here. So we're giving the instantiated object a concrete class type as soon as it's created. Now, before we go further, let's go back out to the Godot area. I'm going to build the project and you can see the shoot action export field shows up. Okay, so for the shoot action, we need to create a input action with the same name. So let's go up to project, project settings, input map, click on the box for add new action and type in shoot add. So your action names can be whatever you want, however you want to assign them. Now for the actual key binding, you have to click over here plus and listening for import, you can easily assign a key just by pressing the key on your uh, keyboard, mouse or gamepad if you have one plugged in. So I'm going to left click for mouse button and hit okay. Um, now, Left mouse button, I think, does conflict with some of the basic UI inputs, um, which you can see if you do show built-in actions. But because we're not going to have any interaction with the UI, it's okay for this demo. And if you need to, you can uh, basically change the default inputs to something else later. But for right now, we just want shoot to be left mouse button, click and hold, and then release. So let's close that. Now we can go into here. And I'm going to say I want to test to see if we can actually get into this code where the shoot action was pressed. So I'm going to set debugging breakpoint. I'm going to hit control shift D to open up the debug run menu. Let's run this in our game editor. So we should get a copy to pop up. Now, initially, nothing's going to happen. Well, it's not going to hit a breakpoint anyway until we press the action. So I'm going to left click press. And as soon as we do that, we see I hit the breakpoint. After the shoot action, we get the shoot projectile. And this would lead into instantiating a copy of the projectile instance. So I will hit continue. 
and we'll go back to the game and we're not going to see anything because when we instantiate this projectile it's currently um an orphan object so it's not actually inside of our world scene and it's probably not going to show up in the viewer because of that so we need to take this instance and we need to add it as a child properly to whatever we want to be the parent of our projectiles in the world we could create, let's say, a projectile object's parent, and then any projectiles we create in any of our projectile launcher scripts, we just add them as a child to the projectile um, menu, I guess you could call it, or projectile node parent. So I'll right click on world, add a child node. Uh, we want a node 2D. So this node 2D, I'm going to rename, uh, I'll just call it projectiles. I think that's pretty clear. So just a way of organizing all of our projectiles so that in um, the game remote view, when we're actually running the game and trying to debug, and we have a million projectiles on our screen, that they're all listed in this menu, so we can um, hide and show them at once, rather than having an enormous list of objects that would just keep going down and down. So for projectiles, how do we easily, from any script in any scene, get them to add to this object? So one way is using groups. So if you click on projectiles, the node, and you go to node on the right hand menu and groups, we can give it a group name that we add it to. So I will call this projectiles parent and hit enter. So now this projectiles node is in the projectiles parent group. And we can get nodes based on what group they're in. So this group is only gonna have one object, at least for now, and that's going to be projectiles, the node 2D, which is a projectiles parent. So if we get node by the group projectiles parent, it should be easy to locate this node within our currently running game. So uh, we'll save the scene. We'll go over to projectile launcher, um, edit the script, and uh, we want to reference the group name somewhere up here. So I'll just do another export variable, export, and we'll say uh, public, I guess this can be a string name, and we'll say projectiles parent group, and we'll make that a get private set, and we can give it a default name as well. So we'll say uh, projectiles parent and end that with a semicolon by the way when i do the equal sign here this is setting the default value on the backing field the automatic backing field so we don't visibly see the backing field but it's there as long as we're using um, default getter and setter methods so we're assigning projectiles parent as the default value so with this projectiles parent group string name we can find the uh, actual node that we want to use as the parent for all of our projectiles now, we could get it every time we shoot a projectile, but a more efficient way would be to get it once on ready. So let's create a private field, and I'll just say node here. Uh, we don't really need to access the node 2D methods, so using a node or the more base class, just for flexibility, um, is maybe a little bit better here. So we'll say private node, I'll say underscore projectiles parent. Just using the underscore there to stick a little bit more in line with um, GD script standard convention, which is that private fields have a underscore leading. Not actually sure if that's the official naming uh, for private C sharp fields in Godot, but we'll do that. So our projectiles parent isn't going to be assigned in the editor. We're going to assign it on ready. So we'll say underscore projectiles parent. And so this is going to be equal to getting the current uh, tree like the current running tree in our game. So you could think of this as the root of everything. And then from the tree root, we can get the nodes by its group name. So we'll get first node in group. And what we're going to pass in here is the string name of the group. So I'm going to control V to paste in projectiles parent group, the property, and end it with the semicolon. So just with this, we should be able to find the first node that has this string name, projectiles parent, as uh, the group that it's set to. And we're going to use that as our projectiles parent. So if this gives nothing, then we might want to give a little bit of a warning. So uh, we can't really function with a null projectiles parent. So we can do a check on ready as well. So we'll say if underscore projectiles parent, and we'll say is equal to null, then we'll do gd dot push warning. So we'll send a warning to the uh, Godot console, basically. And we'll say no projectiles parent found in projectiles group and we can add in the string name so just control paste the property in there projectiles parent group and uh, that should be all we need uh, so because this is a single line of code after an if statement you can actually omit the curly braces so um just a fun trick there
Okay, so let's uh, build the project. Okay, and in our world, we have uh, our projectiles parent group, which has this one object. So if we run the scene, we should not see a warning in the output. Okay, so if I go to output, or a debugger is actually where the uh, warnings and errors show up, and we see that nothing happens bad there. But if I change either the group name here, or if I click on projectile launcher inspector, the name of the group we're looking for is something else. So I'll just add some gibberish after that, and we run then those aren't going to match up and we're not going to have a, a parent to add our projectiles to. So we can see in errors, now we have that warning message, which is just telling us ahead of time, hey, there's no projectiles parent. If we try to instantiate some projectiles now, it's not going to work properly because we don't have a parent to add the child projectiles to. Okay, so let's make sure those match up. And now back in the C-sharp editor, uh, we go into our shoot projectile, if we got no warning message, we should be confident that we can use the parent as uh, the parent for this projectile. So we have the parent set up here. So I'm gonna copy this field down here. So projectiles parent dot add child, and we're gonna put in the projectile instance. So this adds the projectile inside of our scene tree, but it doesn't change the position of it on the screen. Where we probably want the position to be is around the position of our projectile launcher. So we'll say, Projectile instance dot uh, global position is going to be equal to global position. So the global position of our projectile launcher is where we'll start spawning the projectile app. Okay, so we can test this so far. Uh, let's uh, build and run the project. And if I press left mouse button down, then you see we get a uh, projectile, which it falls due to physics, but that's about all it does. It can stack on top of each other because they do have a collision shape, uh, but they're not really doing much besides that. So we want to apply a force to the projectile whenever we launch it. So up at the top, let's create a uh, export variable. We'll say export and public, uh, we'll call it a float and we'll call it something like launch power. So we might say it's a sat two because um, I could see a situation where you might want to change the power of the projectile launcher from other scripts. So I think it's fine to leave that as a public setter and we'll default the value to uh, something like 20,000. 20,000 F makes it a float. So that number might seem kind of high, but that's actually about what you need to move a uh, default rigid body 2D from an instantaneous um, force vector being applied to it. Okay, so we have our launch power. So coming down here at the bottom, we can say uh, projectile instance dat dot uh, force, and then we'll choose apply force. And then we need to give it a, a vector. So a vector is basically going to be composed of a direction and a magnitude here. So we don't have a direction yet, but uh, what we could get for the direction would be the direction to the global mouse position. So when we're getting the mouse position in process, let's also get the direction that we're going to use for shooting the projectiles. So I'll create another private member field. We'll say private vector two, and we'll say um, aim direction. I think that works pretty well, semicolon at the end. And so our underscore aim direction is going to be equal to, and we'll basically need to get a vector that points from our launcher to the mouse position. So that's going to be global position of the launcher dot direction to the mouse position, which we already got inside of this process function. So we only need to get that once. And now we get the global position to the mouse position. Uh, this returns our direction. You can see that it's already normalized. So there's no magnitude component of it. It's just basically which direction we're looking at, which is perfect for our needs. So we'll take the aim direction down here and uh, we'll put it in apply force. But we could create a local variable first before we just put it right into this function. So we'll say vector two launch vector. And this will be equal to our aim direction times our launch power. So here's our magnitude. Here's our direction. We put the launch vector into apply force. And that's basically all we need for simple projectile launch. So let's hit play on our project. Of course, you can see uh, the export variable of launch power showing up here. So let's left click and there is our uh, projectile launching. Now we can see that when it hits the ground, it rotates still. I want to turn off rotation and also 20,000 seems really weak. Uh, as I said, you need to have like at least 10 or 20,000, but inside of our script, I'll bump that up to 30,000, I think. Of course, you don't have to change it in the script. You can just re-customize it here by setting it to whatever value you want. So if you want 50,000, you could just put it in there 
that's basically the whole point of having an export variable. Okay, uh, now to make them not rotate, I want to go into the projectile scene, click on our rigid body 2D, the projectile. So our rotation is at uh, deactivation submenu, and you can lock the rotation so it won't rotate even if it's rolling on the ground. If I go back to the projectile launcher scene now and we hit compile or build, it's going to update the launch power default. Let's run the scene and we can left click and we get our projectiles, which now uh, no longer rotate along the bottom. Okay, so we kind of have the gist of the projectile launcher working at a basic level, but uh, to be honest, having a gray background is kind of boring. So what I'm going to do is uh, just kind of generate and put in a new background image just to make it a little less dull. So here on itch.io from Deepfold, there is a space background generator I found earlier. And I think that this would work pretty good for just putting in a uh, default background. So I'll put a link to this in the description, of course. It's a deep fold and then the space background generator. So here I'm going to create a 16 by 9 ratio image. So I'll do 1280 by uh, 720. And let's just kind of choose whatever we want here. So we can try some of these color schemes here and uh, see what we kind of like. I think I might go with the submerged chimera. And we can just export this. Even better might be to uh, check tile if we want it to loop. So let's export that. Okay, so we have our space background. So in the project, I'm going to create a new folder for art. And here I'll create a folder for Deepfold, the uh, creator of that generator. And then I'll open this in File Manager. And let's paste in the space background image. So space underscore background. Uh, capitals tend to get warnings with files in uh, Godot because they might not work the same on all different operating systems when you export your game. So just as a precaution, you are using uh, only lowercase characters for PNGs and stuff like that. Okay, so we have our tile background inside of the project. I'm going to go to a world. Well, I guess I'm already there. And we can tile it. Um, there's different ways to do that, but I think the simplest way would be to use a texture rect. So I'm going to right click on world, add a child node. We'll do a texture rect. And we want this texture rect to have the uh, texture of the space background. I'll drag and drop that there. And then we want it to stretch mode tile. And let's just kind of position it up here where it can stretch across our entire game area. So I'll take the corners here and I'll just stretch it. And now it's over the entire playable area. To make it be in the background, I can uh, reorganize it to be at the top of the hierarchy. So now all the other objects kind of uh, sit there ahead of. And so now the other objects there um, will show on top of that. Another option would be to go down to visibility or ordering rather and give it a Z index of some negative value. So negative 100, when you have Z index ordering, whatever has the highest value shows on top. So now if I put this on the bottom of the hierarchy, it would still show behind everything else. So uh, up to you, different ways to do that. Uh, but I'll just leave it on top for now. Uh, no real need with the Z index. Now when I do that, I do notice that our ground tiles are a little hard to see. So I might go into the tile map and let's do tile set paint uh, modulate and i'll just change this to a different color so let's pick a new color for our ground maybe like a brown and click here uh, that's a little dull maybe i'll brighten it up a bit and make it a little bit more reddish and click there i guess that works so we can hit play and there we have our game with the background. I can see I did not get it to tile quite right there. So I suppose what I could do actually is uh, turn off tile and we'll put it in scale mode and just kind of have it like this for now. So we'll just, all it needs to really cover is the camera area, which is this uh, box with the pink line here. Okay, and maybe shrink it a little bit more. Okay, good enough, I suppose. Okay, and we run it and yeah, that's looking a little better. So anyway, with our projectile launcher, we'd probably like it to have a little bit more control than just left click and we just get a static unchanging 30,000 units of power um, applying to our force vector. Eventually we're gonna have a target over here and we'd like to be able to reach that. So we can create a power multiplier that scales with how long we press the uh, shoot button down for before we release it. So I'm gonna go back to projectile launcher Let's edit the script. And then we're going to create a new function, which is going to be public void, let's say charge projectile. Uh, no parameters for right now. And 
when action is pressed shoot action we're actually going to charge the projectile so charge projectile and we only want to shoot the projectile when this action is released so we'll say else if and we can say at event at event dot is action released and we'll say shoot action then we're going to shoot the projectile so i'll just get this line and move it down here now the condition here might seem a little flimsy. If the action is released, shoot action. Well, what if we never started charging the projectile yet? We might want to have a variable to check and make sure that we we're charging the projectile or we pressed the shoot action before uh, we actually allow shoot projectile to uh, release. Now, I think it would work okay like this, but let's just add an extra level of checking just to be sure. So when action is pressed, charge projectile, we'll say, is charging and we'll set that to true now when we shoot the projectile we're no longer charging so we'll say uh underscore is charging equals false and this charging member field we'll just create this up here so private uh boolean underscore is charging and we'll default this to false so when the script starts we're not charging yet and now this will just be uh, updated whenever we start charging and whenever we shoot the projectile so to use that boolean, we'll check first if we have the shoot action released, and then we'll say and and is charging is true. So we have to be charging before we can shoot the projectile, and then we wait for the action to be released of shoot action before we shoot as well. So both of these have to be true when we put and and. Okay, also, when is charging is true, we can go up on our process function and add in some extra code. So we'll say if underscore is charging, then we're gonna run some code. And uh, we'll basically track the amount of time since the charging has started. Some, and we'll use that as a multiplier to increase the power of our final shoot. So let's have up here a private, uh, this will be a float so that later we can uh, multiply it by a vector easier. And we'll say charging time or charge time, I think works pretty good. We'll default this to 0, 0.0F. Okay, so the charge time, basically, whenever we run the process, the delta is the time between frames. So if we do charge time plus equals delta, then we're just adding the time between frames whenever uh, we're charging and the process function runs, which happens on every frame. So uh, we're adding a double to a float. So we do need to cast it with parentheses float to so convert the double into a float. So both of these variable types are numbers that have uh, decimal points trailing after the number. So it works good for time because sometimes you would have time and fraction of a second. So whenever we shoot, we do want to reset the charge time. So down here at the bottom, we could say underscore charge time is equal to 0 0.0 F. So whenever is charging is false, we want to reset the charge time. And this would actually be a good candidate for creating a custom setter function for is charging. So this is a field, we would want to create a property and then use is charging as the backing field. So if we go up here to the top, let's create this time a private boolean is charging. So then for our is charging boolean property, we want to create custom getters and setters. So I'm going to do curly braces and then new line, and we're going to just put in get, and I'm going to create a lambda function. Uh, which will basically mean that right after here is the function code of the getter. So what we're returning here for our getter function is underscore is charging, semicolon. So this just means our getter function returns this field, which is our uh, backing field of the property. Now, there's also another way of creating setter and getter functions, which is you would do set, and then you do curly braces. And if you add a new line, then in here you can put your code. So whenever you have the set function, that means a value is being passed into the property. And that's what you're going to generally set to the backing field. So if I do underscore is charging, I want to say equals to the value. The value is the argument coming into the setter function. So with our custom setter, now that we know that the value is being set, we can do other code uh, that we want to execute whenever is charging is set. So I suppose we could say um, if is charging is false, then we're going to say underscore charge time is also equal to 0.0f. So we reset the charge time whenever is charging property is set to false.
Now what this means, if we take the property name and we go down here to the bottom, is that instead of setting the field, we would set the property is charging is equal to false. And now we don't need the line about charge time because whenever we set the property is charging to false, as I just mentioned, the charge time is going to be reset as well. Uh, so that's kind of one way of how you can use set of functions. So that's one example of how you can use set of functions. They're also good for emitting signals, which is Godot's uh, version of events, basically, for communicating between scripts by subscribing one object to a different object's event. Then when that event triggers, the subscribing object triggers one of its um, functions. So to be consistent with the property usage, if we're going to be setting it to false here in order to trigger the charge time reset, then we should probably also go up here and change the field setting to the property setting to true. Now, this isn't going to actually change what happens on charge projectile. It's just going to mean that we have to go through that setter function in order to set the value of the backing field rather than directly setting it. So just remember when you're setting a property that any of the getter and setter code is going to execute when you set the property to true or false or whatever property value it is, whether it's a number or anything else. So we have our charge time incrementing whenever is charging is true, which is after we start charge projectile, but before the projectile shoots. So let's go up to the top again, and I'm going to um, create another export, and we'll say public float, and this will be time power bonus. Uh, we could say per second. So this will be public float, and I'll say time power multiplier, get set. So let's say for every one second of charging time, how much do we want to increase the power of our launch? So let's say something like uh, 0 0.5 here. So what I mean by this is that we'll take half of this power and add it to the launch whenever one second passes. So I, I'm going to create a summary for that property real quick. So um, there's another plugin for doing this. If you put three slashes, you can add an XML summary to a C sharp field or property or method of your class. So just really quick, I believe that's the C sharp dev kit, which you can get from the marketplace if you want that. So uh, we're going to give this a description. So for, so for this property, whatever value we have set here, we multiply that by the launch power in order to get how much bonus power we add to the projectile at the time of launch. So now if we go down to the bottom, uh, we'll get that uh, bonus power, I suppose. So let's say float final power is going to be equal to launch power plus, and I'll put this in parentheses, for, um, to make sure order for operation goes correctly. And we'll say uh, launch power times here, underscore charge time times time power multiplier. Okay, so this is taking the launch power, which is 30,000. If we have one second of charge time, then that's 30,000 times one, which is 30,000. And we'd multiply that by the time power multiplier, 0. 0.5, which means we get an extra 15,000 units of power added to a launch power for the final power. And we can charge longer for it to uh, be more powerful than that. So I won't put a cap on this tutorial, but you could uh, limit it, like um, clamp the value of charge time between zero seconds and 10 seconds, for instance. So we'll take our final power and replace the launch power there. Our final power times the direction gives us our final launch vector. Cool. So uh, let's run the game. And now I'll press and hold for three or four seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, and let go. And you can see it goes way further now. So if I just tap it, we just get a small projectile launch. But if I hold it, we can shoot further, which makes it a lot more dynamic and interesting for an actual game um, trying to hit a target. Like let's say we had an area here for scoring, like we'll add later. So our projectile launcher, when we're charging it, we can't really see any indicator that we're charging. So we probably want a little bit of feedback for that for our player's sake to know that, hey, he's charging the projectile. We should show kind of a charging up animation or something. So let's get a reference to the Sprite 2D node in our projectile launcher script. So uh, up here, I will just kind of keep going down the list of exports. At export public Sprite 2D. And uh, I'll just call this Sprite. Get private set. And then we want to have a color that we're going to uh, progressively change towards. Okay, so for our sprite, let's go down here. 
So down here at the bottom of our shoot projectile, let's do sprite dot modulate or self modulate rather. The difference between modulate is it applies color changes to any child nodes as well. But if you do self modulate, it only applies to the node in question, which is the sprite node. So we'll say sprite modulate, and this is a color value, right? So we want to assign a color. Uh, when we shoot the projectile, we're resetting the color. So we're going to reset the color here. So I'll say um, equals color, and I'll give it four parameters: one, 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 one. Uh, the first three ones are uh, the RGB. Oh, and you need to put a new here because we're creating a new color. So we're constructing a new color, uh, and you can see the parameters are R for red, G for green, B for blue, and A for alpha, which is the transparency. So if you make all of those one, you get white, basically. Okay, so that will allow us to reset the color. Then to go towards a different color like red, uh, let's go up to the process function. So we'll say uh, sprite.selfmodulate. And we're going to be assigning it to a new color whenever the process function runs. So we'll say new color, and I'll um, add a new line between the parameters because we're going to add four parameters here. And our first one is going to be one because uh, we always want the red to be full. And then the second one is going to be one minus something. The third one is going to be one minus something. And then the last one is going to be one. So we basically have to figure out how much green and blue we're removing from our color in order to give it kind of more of a reddish tone. So let's base that off on charge time. We could uh, add more export properties at the top. Um, I'm not going to bother for right now, though. So let's do minus in parentheses underscore charge time. So uh, one second of charge time, how much do we want to remove from the uh, the color? And I'll say charge time divided by five. So this means that it needs five seconds for the value here to be completely reduced to zero. And I'll just copy and paste that down here. And that basically is our color changing for the sprite. Okay, uh, now let's build the project. I'm gonna click on projectile launcher. Let's assign the new uh, export property, sprite 2D. Let's hit play. And now if I press and hold down, we should be able to have our little launcher churn into a completely red color over five seconds. And you can see our launch is pretty powerful there. When we launch, the color resets. So kind of a nice visual indicator, just showing us, hey, we're charging things up. Now you can get a lot more fancy with that. Maybe your launcher shakes or grows bigger or something like that uh, later on, but that's all we need for now. So let's add in one more indicator of a text label for how powerful our current charge is. So I'll right click on projectile launcher. Let's add a label. Now, uh, normally control elements marked green, you would use them for UI, but you can also put them uh, above a character like this. So we'll create the label. Uh, w to go to move mode and we'll position it up here. And let's put in the text box power. And uh, let's just kind of position it about where the top of the launcher is. Okay, so I'm going to attach a script to this label for right now. Let's uh, rename it power label. And now I'll attach a new script. So power label CS, we will, I guess I'll just put that under objects for right now. Sure. Let's create an ad. And I'm going to want a reference to the projectile launcher script. So let's do export. And I'll do public projectile launcher. And I could just say launcher, get private set. Now let's compile the script and I'll assign the launcher inside of here. So projectile launcher. So what we're going to want to do is whenever the launcher power value changes, the amount of power it's about to be launched by, then uh, we will take that value and we'll set it in the text here. So in order to do that, uh, we need a property we can access from the launcher script or even better yet, we need a signal we can connect to so that when that signal is emitted with a new power value, uh, then we update that in this power label. So on the projectile launcher, let's go up to the top and I'm going to do a square bracket signal. Now under here, you need to make the signal public and it's gonna be a delegate void. And let's say uh, power changed event handler. The event handler part at the end is important because Godot will take it with the signal tag and it'll make it that it will automatically create the power changed event for this event handler. 
So the event handler, we're going to define uh, what parameters go through to the event whenever the event is triggered. So in parentheses, we should say float uh, launch power and semicolon at the end. So that creates our signal in C sharp. Now on the power label script on ready, we can take our launcher script. So we'll say launcher dot power changed. So you see, we didn't create a power changed event. We only defined the event handler and the signal tag took that and created the event for us. So power changed. And when you have an event, you can add or remove uh, functions that are going to be called whenever power changed event is triggered. So you do that with plus equals and let's give it a new function to run. So I'm going to say on power changed. Now we haven't created that function inside of here. So let's create the function down here, private void on power change. And it needs to have the same parameter signatures. So we're going to need a float and we'll say new power. The names of the variable don't need to be the same, but the types and ordering do. So we have the new power here. Let's take the label, which is the class type. And let's take the text and set it to text equals power uh, semicolon. And then let's uh, add in the new power. So plus new power combines this string with this. It automatically gets converted into a string from a float. And then that will be the text of our power label. And that's all we need to do on our power label script. Now on the projectile launcher, uh, let's have this power changed actually be set. So our launch power, I'm actually going to rename that with control H and let's make that base power and I'll replace all instances of it. And now let's create a public but non exported launch power. So public float launch power, and then we'll do get and give it a backing field. So down here we'll have a private float launch power. So we're going to return the launch power for the get and for the set, we're going to say launch power equals value. And whenever launch power changes, we want to emit this power changed signal. So to do that, you call emit signal, you give it the string name of the event, which was power changed, and then we give it the arguments we want to pass through to the event. And that's going to be underscore launch power. So whenever we set the launch power property, we also emit the power changed signal, which is handy and a good use for setters. Okay, now we need to make sure that uh, whenever we update the amount of time charged, we set the launch power. And we can also give it a default launch power as well. So the default launch power on ready, uh, we can just get launch power is equal to base power. So uh, that'll set this value here initially. And then to make sure that the launch power is set uh, once after the scene loads. Okay, now we just need to update the launch power um, down here on process would be good. So we'll say launch power equals and then we'll get that equation we set down here. So the final power, I'm going to grab this, cut that away and remove this line, go back up, paste it in here. So the launch power is going to be equal to this equation and we update that uh, on charging. And you know, uh, at this point, maybe having a charge time property also makes sense. Uh, so that whenever the charge time is updated, that we run this equation. Actually, that makes a lot of sense. So I will create charge time property as well. And this is charging property, actually. I think it makes sense for that to be public. Other classes might want to know if the projectile launcher is actually charging or not. Uh, that's a good candidate for a public. So let's also create a uh, public float charge time. And the git will return the charge time. But the setter function will do underscore charge time equals value. And we'll run this calculation for the launch power based on whatever the charge time is. So whenever the charge time updates even to zero, we should be able to calculate the launch power. So down here in process, when we have is charging and we set the charge time, let's set the property instead. And actually, now that we have a charge time property, I could also uh, change the sprite thing to be inside of there as well. So I'll cut this and let's bring that up to our charge time property. And I'll just paste that in. So if the charge time is zero, then uh, it's going to show white. And if it's anything above zero, then it's going to shift towards red. Okay, and then we don't need this launch power line here because that's taken care of in the charge time property. And uh, down here, we don't need this as well because it's taken care of in the charge time property. And for the launch vector, we're going to do launch power. 
So our final launch power is our calculated amount times the aim direction. And looking at all of this, I think that's probably good. A launch power emits the signal. Um, and then charge time is a property now, so it can run the code we need to whenever the charge time is updated. And let's give it a shot. Let's uh, compile and run the project and see if all those changes actually still work. So we're going to have our label up here. Now you can see by default, it doesn't show anything. Uh, that's because we haven't set the property uh, after all the scripts have loaded. So we will want to fix that. But if I press left click and hold, we can see our power going up. So this is how much power we're applying on Enforce. We let go and release. Uh, it didn't reset, but if I left click and press again, now it's recalculating. So uh, we could decide, do we want this to reset as soon as we shoot the projectile? Or do we want it to show the last shown value? So resetting it would just be um, take the charge time and set it to zero. That does actually make sense because uh, when the charge time is set to zero, it's going to reset the color. So in uh, our is charging property, when we set this to false, we're going to change the uh, charge time property, not the backing field here, and set that to zero. Okay, now if we run it, one property is going to set the other one. So when we release it with shoot power, it's going to reset the power, it's going to reset the color. Now as for showing the launch power as soon as the script loads, what we can do is uh, set deferred on the launch power property and set that equal to the base power initially. So when you set deferred, it's basically waiting for everything else in the scene to catch up. So uh, you need another object to subscribe to your signals before it can receive data from the signals. So to make sure that that happens first, we'll do set deferred on the property name, which is uh, launch power. And we're gonna set that equal to the base power. So you could just think of this as waiting a frame and then setting the launch power to the base power. So um, doing that should mean that the power will update as soon as the game launches, basically. So we can see our power set to 30,000 there. We've waited for other scripts that are connecting to the signal to catch up and it will show properly now. So we have our power indicator and we know exactly how much force is going to be applied before we shoot. So right now the game doesn't really have a goal, so let's give it one by saying that if we can get the projectile inside of a moving box, then we can score a point. And then we'll create a signal uh, that we can react to that and keep a score counter in the top left as well. And I'm going to do this with a 2D scene to start, and I'll say score box, and let's save this into uh, the project. Maybe this would go in something more like a gameplay folder because it's not really an object in the scene, so to speak. It's not a enemy. It's just a region. So we'll save our score box inside of here. So our score box is going to need some kind of texture so that we can see it on the screen and make it obvious that there is a scoring area. So I'll right click and add a child node and we'll actually use a texture rect, which is a control node, but we'll put it nested inside of our 2D scene here. So for the texture, I'm going to click over here in the inspector on the drop down and go to uh, gradient texture 2D. So then you'll see a left to right gradient here. And let's change it to something else. Let's click on the texture, expand it down, go to fill. I'm going to change this to radial. So now if I move this to the center, then we can see that it's basically like a circular type of texture. And what we can do is click on the gradient part of this and change the color. So I will take the white color and I'll make it completely alpha transparent. So you take the 255 alpha and put it to zero. Okay, now it's going to be transparent on the edges. But we can see that it kind of fades between the two colors still. So I might also want to go in here and change the base color as well. Uh, so what would be good for a scoring area? Then also I kind of want to make this into like a donut. So I'll left click to add a, another color point on our gradient and let's move this close to the white. And then this will be, let's say black 255. And this first black, I'm going to try removing it. So I'm going to right click on it. And then this first black, I'll make that completely transparent. And let's add another point. So now I'm going to adjust this uh, black circle point. Basically, the idea here is I'm just trying to make a ring texture of sorts. So if I bring these points closer together, okay, yeah, yeah, that's kind of more what I was going for. Then we can create a ring from this gradient. So in the circle, we have our scoring area. And then on the outskirts, we just have transparent and in the center, it's transparent as well. 
So uh, we probably want to change the colors a little bit, uh, make it look more like a scoring ring. Maybe we shift it towards green. I mean, a little cheesy, but I guess that works. Like a blue-green, I think it's fine. And then we can take the points to the left and right if we want to affect that glow and make that a little bit more similar too. So here, we'll get rid of the red and we'll make this like a blue-green. Okay, so now basically we have three points creating a blue glowy ring in the center. Now it does look a little blurry, so I think maybe we want to turn up the width and height on that. So 128, 128. And I guess that's pretty okay. Um, so what you can do if you want there to be more of a blur glow is you can bring the points further out like this. If you want there to be an inner glow, then you can go to the left. And then the center point is just kind of for controlling the ring. So maybe I want to uh, move the center ring further to the outside of the texture, make it a little bit bigger. And that's pretty much what we'll go with for the texture, I suppose. So now we do need to have an area where we actually score. And when I say an area, I mean a collision shape area. So I'm going to right click on score box and we're going to add an area 2D. So our area 2D is a region that detects um, objects entering it, but it isn't generally used for actual physical collisions. So you don't run into an area 2D like you would a static rigid body. Um, but you can enter the area and you can trigger events based on that happening. So I'll use a area 2D and this area 2D needs a collision shape. So I'll right click add child collision shape 2D enter. And now let's uh, go in here and do a new circle shape. So the circle shape, of course, we want to put that kind of right in the middle of our texture. So let's uh, bring this in here. And then I'm going to hit Q to uh, go to selection mode. And I'm going to take this scale point and I'm going to bring this all the way out. W to reposition it again. And we put it right in the center. And then that is our scoring area. So uh, let's go to the world. And let's put one of these in. So in gameplay, we have our score box. Let's add it to the world hierarchy. I'll hit W to move it and we'll position it uh, kind of right around this moon slash planet. Now it's a little small. So what we might want to do is uh, just scale it up. So I will go to uh, scale mode. You can press S or click over here. And then let's uh, scale the size. And then W to reposition it. And we can position it right about there. I'll hit E or S to scale. And then let's just make it the full size of this moon. Position it right around there. Okay, so I'm actually going to have the score box move around too. So let's go into uh, score box. And I'm going to add an animation player to the root here. So add child. And we'll say animation player. So in the animation player, I'll add a new animation. Let's call this uh, patrol or loop, something like that. And we're going to want to adjust a property where we move both the texture rect and the area 2D together. So those are separate nodes and they're attached to the score box hierarchy, but we want to change both of these together. And I think I want to do that without moving the score box itself, though you probably could do that as well. So you could either add a child node to score box in order to um, have a child that you can move with both the texture rect and the area 2D under it, or we can adjust the score box's position itself. I suppose in this case, we'll um, adjust the score box's properties and we'll give that a shot. So I'm going to add a track down here and we'll say it's a property track on the score box 2D node and we're going to move the position. So in the animation window down here, right click insert a key. So this will be our starting position of 0, 0. And we can kind of see on the world map if this is our starting position 0, 0. We probably want to go left and maybe down into the right and then back up again. So let's do that. On the right hand side of the animation window, you can set how long you want the duration of the animation to be. Uh, you can adjust that after you create the animation with the speed scale if you just want it to play faster than it was defined in the animation. Uh, but let's say that we want it to take one second to do a full loop, essentially. So uh, let's go to something like 0.3 seconds. So I'll hit W to go to move mode. We'll take the score box expand the transform and you'll see that since we have an animation player there's a uh, add keyframe button for basically every property in uh, Godot so you can animate just about anything you want using the animation player and so let's move this over to the left I'm uh, holding shift down so that I move on one axis and I'm going to move it 100 pixels to the left actually let's say 
200 pixels. And now I'm going to hit the keyframe button here, which adds a keyframe to the animation chart down here. And uh, we want to do that basically two more times. So I'm going to uh, W move mode, select the score box, move it down, and let's say 100 pixels down. And then I'm going to keyframe it here. And then let's make the animation a bit bigger. Uh, so we need 0.3 seconds to go to 0.9. And then we'll end the animation at 1.2 seconds. So I'll make it a 1.2 second animation. So let's go to 0.9 on the uh, animation window down here. Oh, and no, if you do want to change the snapping times, you can change it from 0 0.1 seconds down here to something else if you need uh, more precise keyframes. And let's go 100 pixels or 200 pixels to the right and then keyframe. And at 1.2 seconds, we'll go back to the starting position, which is 0, 0, and I'll keyframe. So you can also type your values and the inspector over there. Okay, so it seems like um, my timing was a little off. So here's point. Let me zoom in on the timeline, actually. So we have 0.3 seconds, and then this is 0.7 seconds. I need to move this over 0.1 seconds. So each keyframe is 0.3 seconds in duration, and we want this to loop. So I'm going to click this looping icon over here and hit play. So if you want it to keep going in the same direction, you can just have it uh, loop like this. You can also have it bounce backwards when it gets to the end if you click on the loop one more time. So now it's going to go like this which uh, I think is a little bit cooler, actually. So we'll go with that. Now, to make sure that this animation plays automatically, click right here next to the animation names, auto play on load. So now if we run the game uh, with play, project gets built. And what you'll notice is that we don't actually see our box at all. So over here, what we're changing in the score box scene is the position of our root node. So that means when the scene starts, it's actually, I think, coming more like down here. But I think what we wanted to do was to adjust more of the relative position. So we're not gonna mess with the position of the score box. We're gonna take these properties of the position and we're gonna move it down one layer. So I'm gonna take score box, I'm gonna add a child node, let's say node 2D, and I'll say uh, position, I guess. And then I'm gonna take these child nodes and move it under here. And uh, let's pause the animation for a second. And so essentially we need these same values, but instead of adjusting the score box, we adjust the position child node. So do position there. And I don't think we can copy paste the keyframe between these different uh, tracks, but we can add keyframes at the same moments in time with uh, just right click, insert key, right click, insert key. And then we'll just take the values and make sure that they're the same down here. So we have a negative 200 pixels at the 0.3 seconds keyframe. So I paste that value in and then we have negative 200 and then positive 100 you can also type it in I think that might be a little faster and here we have 0 100 so 0 100 and then finally we have 0 0 so now I'm going to delete the uh, score box position track okay and when the animation runs now it's going to be moving the child position so in our world the score box's main position is still up here so it's just going to move the child objects to the left down to the right and back up but the official position of the score box root node, which is kind of invisible on the screen, will stay there in this position. So let's hit play, and uh, it should work this time. Okay, so there we have our animation. I would say that moves pretty fast. Actually, that might be fine. Let's make it a little bit more of a challenge to actually hit the box. So we have our area, and we need to make it so that when a projectile enters the area, that uh, we score a point and then we'll have a little UI label display in order to show that we scored the point. So first in our score box, let's add a C sharp script here. So it's gonna be scorebox.cs with Pascal casing. And I'm gonna save that in gameplay along with the scorebox TSC and scene. So for this to work, we need to know about the area 2D so that we can get its signals. So if you go to inspector node and you click on area 2D, you can see the signals that a area 2D has by default. So we want to know when a body entered, and then we want to check if that body that entered is of type projectile, and if so, we'll score a point. So inside of scorebox CS, let's do at export, and we're going to have a public area 2D score area, and this will be get private set. Okay, so we assume that this gets set in the inspector, and then on ready, we want to do score area dot uh, body entered and then we're going to add a subscribing method to this signal and that is going to be on body entered you, and you don't add the parentheses we're not calling it here we're just referencing the name of the function so we need to do private void on body entered and this is going to receive a node 2d 
body. So inside of here, we want to check if the body is of type projectile. So if body is projectile, then we can proceed and we're going to proceed by increasing the score. Okay, so now that we've reached this point of having a score and then needing to send the score to the UI, it's a good point to start talking about how you actually communicate your data between objects that exist on different scenes. So inside of your Godot editor, if you have a scene and different objects exist in the same scene, like if we go to world, um, then we can see in the projectile launcher here, it's very easy to use an export field to assign something like the sprite. If you know the sprite exists as a uh, child of the projectile launcher or it exists in the same world scene, then you can just assign them in the inspector and you can grab any property at any time you want from those referenced objects. But if you are, let's say, loading up game worlds or levels during gameplay that don't exist in the base scenes. So here I have my gameplay scene and I'd probably have some systems set up and when the game loads, I want to load a level. So that level hasn't been loaded in the editor yet. And that means that if I have a system that relies on knowing about, let's say, uh, the world's tile map, then I can't just set that in the inspector because it's not in the editor yet. So one way of sending data between objects is to use resources that have signals attached to them. And you can also have other uh, variable set on those resources. And those resources can have other data set on them. You can even put functions on a resource. So for instance, I could create a score resource um, and then that resource can be set in the inspector for any object because resources, uh, when you save them, they get saved to the project file system. So because that's the case, it doesn't exist inside of the scene. And that means multiple scenes can reference the same resource. And then that resource can serve as the intermediary communication between your objects that exist on different scenes. So once this clicks for you, hopefully you'll see how useful it can be. So I want to create a score resource, which will hold the score for the game. And we'll even put a signal on it for score changed. So let's create a score resource. If I click in the project and create a folder, I suppose in this case, I'll call it data, since this is like main core game data, stuff that we might want to put in a save state later if uh, it was that kind of game. This is more arcadey, to be honest, so it'd be more like a one shot and done, and then maybe you save a score list. But in any case, uh, main game data that we want to remember, we could put in a data folder. So I'm gonna create a new script here, and this script is gonna inherit from resource, and we're gonna call it the score.cs. So let's create that and I'm going to open up score.cs. So in this score resource, I'm going to want to create a value that can be changed. So we can say export here. Um, that would allow us to set the default score, for instance, and the inspector for the resources. And we'll say that the public int score, or actually we don't want it to be the same as the class name. So I'll say value. So the value of the score, or you could call it amount, whatever works for you. And this will be a git set but public so that it can be changed from other objects easily. And I'll default this to zero. Now I want to create a score resource. So to create a resource, you right click in a folder and you do create new resource. Now, if this was a GD script class and we gave it a class name, then we'd be able to just search score here and we should see it pop up in the list. But because this is C sharp, um, automatically adding uh, class names to the create new node or create new resource uh, dropdown menus, um, is not currently a thing. I've seen some plugins out there which are supposed to basically give you the ability to add that sort of thing, but honestly, I haven't gotten it to work yet. So um, the standard workaround just out of the box is we would go to resource and create it, and then you give it the name of the resource. So I might call it score.tres, save. And now you click on the resource, and we need to assign a script to it. So to change a resource into a score resource, we add the score script to it, just like that. And let's compile the project or build the project. And there we have a score value. So not too bad, just like one extra step or so. So this value is the score at the start of the game. And the score can change during the game. But the score from our project will always be this zero value. Now there's a class in Godot called resource saver, which you can use to save a resource to an external file to be your save game state. So you can save resources or you can save nested resources so the score resource could become part of that save file if you want it to be i'm not going to go into that in this tutorial but 
if you want to have save games or save your state for things like score or uh, player position, uh, that would be the next place I would check. We'll just have the score only during runtime, and after the game closes, the score is basically wiped. So we have our scores CS here. Let's go to score box, and in the score box script, I want to add a reference to our score resource. And we're going to do public score, uh, score, the name of the property, and we'll do get private set. So you can see that even if in the Godot editor, uh, we don't see the score class name show up in the create new resources menu, it's still there in C sharp. We can still reference it and we can still get access to all of its properties and methods. So at least on the coding side of things, it should be very clear still how to uh, use our custom classes. So we're going to set the score resource. And then when the projectile enters, we want to increment its value. So if body is projectile on body entered, then we'll do score dot value plus equals, let's say just one point. So if we get a projectile in the region, we get one point. Now that is going to increment the score, right? So we have our setter on value. This gets incremented by one and then nothing really happens. So if we add another script, like let's say our score label connect to our value, uh, we wouldn't actually get the feedback that the score has changed. Now we could do on process function, we just update the text to whatever the score value is. But that's kind of inefficient. We don't really want to be calling the set text function every single millisecond of the game. So what would be a lot better is if we have a private backing field and then we have a custom setter that emits the signal that the value has changed so that we only update when the value has actually changed. So let's make a custom getter and setter. But before that, we need a private field, of course. So private int underscore value, and we'll set that to zero. I'm going to get rid of this part here since we're using uh, this backing field instead of an automatic one now. And let's do the getter and setter. So get, I'm going to do lambda underscore value. Okay, getter done. And then set. So we're going to do underscore value equals uh, the value we just passed in. So the setter parameter value and our backing field value have a dangerously close name. So Maybe I would change that in the end to something else, but as long as you understand that this value is whatever is being passed into the setter, then we should be okay for right now. Okay, so the value changes and we want to emit the signal. So resources do have a built-in signal called changed, but I'm not sure that that has a parameter and I do want to pass a parameter through. So I'll, I'll create a custom signal here. Let's do a signal and we're gonna have public delegate void and this will be score changed event handler and let's give it the parameters so we're going to have the int new score and that's basically all we need there so when the score changes down here we emit the signal and that's going to be score changed then we pass through the new score which is actually the uh, underscore value now uh what if the value here is set to the same value that it already is uh it's probably not like a big thing but what we could just do is we could check if the value underscore value is equal to the value being passed in, then we just return. So I kind of like to do this if I don't want there to be more signals emitted. So what this prevents is that the value won't be updated unless we're actually setting the value to a new value. Because if the value is five and we set it to five, there's really no need to call the emit signal score changed, right? So we could just actually return here and then only we set the value to the value parameter if the value being passed in is actually different. So I've been trying that out for certain property setters and um, I mean, it seems to work fine. So basically we're only gonna emit the score change signal if a new value is actually set to the score. So now that we have the signal, we can create our score label and receive the data. So let's go to the gameplay scene. I'm going to create here on the gameplay node, a child node, I'm going to make a canvas layer. So this is basically going to separate all of the control UI from the game world. So if I add a canvas layer, so you can think of this as a layer that will sit over everything else in the game world. The game world is kind of the background. And then this UI stuff is just always going to be centered on the screen. It's separate from the game world. And it just kind of gives us our um, statistics indicator, like player health or the score of the current game. So inside of here, I'm going to right click, add a child node, and let's say label, and we'll add that in. I'm going to rename this to be score label. 
And then our score label, I'll right click on it to save a branch scene. And then we'll create a UI folder. And then inside of here, score label.tsn save. And I'll attach a script to our score label, which of course will be score label.cs, inheriting from label in C sharp language. And we're in here. So our score label, we need a reference to the resource so that we can connect to its signal. And then we'll have the method which will trigger every time the score gets updated. So export, and then we're going to need public score resource. And score is the name of that resource. And we'll do git private set. Okay, and uh, then on ready, we want to connect to that signal. So public override, uh, let's see, underscore ready, autocomplete, finish it. We don't need base dot ready. So I cut that away. And we'll do score dot score changed event plus equals on score changed. Of course, we haven't created that function. So we need public void on score changed. And remember that event has a parameter, so we need int new score. Okay, and of course, when we receive the new score, what are we going to do with the label? We're going to set its text. So we can say text is equal to uh, whatever we want, basically. So score, maybe I do a colon um, in the quotations for the base string, and we're going to add the score to that. So plus new score, the integer new score automatically gets converted into a string which is a little different from uh, GDScript. If you were doing GDScript, you'd have to wrap it in um, str and then parentheses. So GDScript would be like this. If it's not a string, then you need to convert it. But in C Sharp, our uh, concatenation symbol will basically take these other uh, types and automatically convert them into a string, which is kind of nice. The other thing we might want to do is when the label starts here, we might just want to grab the current value and set the score to that as well. So uh, let's say text equals score colon and we're going to say plus score dot value. So we don't need the uh, resource to emit the signal the first time because we're just going to grab the value from it directly, um, which is fine for right now. So so we have our score label down here. We don't need to worry about positioning it within the camera because remember our canvas layer is always going to be positioned on top of our screen. So uh, this blue line here, you can think of that as your viewport. And then the camera is going to put whatever's inside of the camera in our viewport, so to speak. So we just need this score label to be within our viewport. And we could say score colon um, uh, whatever we want the default text to be. This is going to be replaced during gameplay. It's kind of small, so let's change the font size, label settings, new label settings, uh, font 24 or maybe 32 even. Yeah, I guess that works pretty okay. And let's build the project. And then we need to connect our score resource to our different objects. So uh, right here in the score label, we just drag the score.tres into here. Now, even though in C sharp, this needs specifically a score resource. If you click on the drop down menu, it doesn't know in Godot about those um, C sharp custom resource classes, at least currently out of the box in 4.2 Godot. Uh, hopefully they do change this in the future though. So you can see that right here, there are so many different resource objects and none of them are actually the score object. So you can select at the very bottom here using a load or quick load, the score resource that you wanna set here. But I think for right now, it's much easier if you just drag and drop from your file system. So if we take score resource.tres and we put it in there, then our score is assigned. So I think that's the easy way to do it for C sharp scripting at the moment. And then in our world scene, uh, our what were we using? The score box. Yeah. Okay. So the score box needs to have the score dot uh, put into here. And we might actually set that in the uh, the project scene, not the instance here, so that it'll apply to all score boxes. So score box here. Let's assign score dot into here. And we need the score area for the scoring to work. So I'm going to assign the area 2D as well. And so now you can see we have the score resource referenced in our score box scene, but we also in our gameplay scene, which we can't see the score box without enabling editable children like this, which may not be preferable, that the score label has the score.tres referenced here. And if we jump into the score scene, uh, we would have the same thing. Thing going on here, except that the score label doesn't have this the script attached, which it should. So uh, let's go into UI and attach the script. Now it has the score property there, so let's assign score. Okay, yep. And back in the gameplay scene, it should still have the same score resource. 
But you can see how you can reference resources across different scenes, which is really important. So if we hit play now, then in theory, it should work. So all we need to do is get a uh, projectile to end up inside of this area. So let's uh, press and hold left mouse button and try to launch it. Okay, look at that. I scored a point. And if I get the projectile inside of there, then we can get more points. I missed, so obviously I didn't get a point there. And there, uh, another point. So you can see that the communication between the UI that receives the final scoring update and the area TD, which tells the score to increment, is handled through that third party resource object. So it's a cool way of doing things and I highly recommend trying resources out in that way. Now, uh, one last thing I might want to just have for cleanup is these resources never go away. So let's create a timer on the projectile script so that basically after X seconds, the projectiles just disappear. So in projectile, we can go into the script. Now you can actually create a timer like this, add a file node timer, but Let's actually just create it inside of the script itself so that we never need to worry about assigning a timer in the inspector. So inside of a projectile, let's have a private timer underscore free timer. And then on ready, we will create that timer. So when the projectile enters the scene, it gets created and then the ready function runs. So after the projectile is ready, the timer is going to start. So public override void underscore ready underscore ready and let's uh clean that up a bit there and then we're going to instantiate a new timer so underscore free timer is going to be equal to new timer now i don't think the timer constructor has any um parameters so you can't just pass in the length of the timer immediately but we can do underscore free timer dot uh let's see time something wait time and we'll set that equal to well let's just create a wait time property so up here at the top export public float uh, time to live and we'll set that to let's say 3f three seconds oh and, and wait i'm defining that like it's a field so time to live get private set and this will be equal to 3f okay now we take the time to live and we pass that into the wait time and then we want to connect to the timeout signal from the timer so underscore free timer dot timeout we can see that signal there and then we plus equals on timeout no parentheses again and then we want to start the timer so underscore free timer dot start okay so once it's started it's going to wait that amount of seconds then we'll get the time out event to trigger and we can go public void on time out which of course we want to remove this projectile from the scene so we do uh q free so there's also a free method uh when you do free it removes itself immediately and then q3 i think is at yeah the end of the current frame so if there's anything else that needed to happen during that frame concerning the projectile that code runs first and then after the frame is finished everything's good then it frees at that point in time so the difference between q3 and free isn't probably too relevant to you guys right now but uh when you start getting into things like unit testing sometimes you do want to call free and have it free immediately because your unit test might not be waiting for the end of the frame and you want it to be removed before the end of a specific test. Just an example. But here we'll do Q free. So let's see, that should pretty much be it for our projectile. So if you want something to be removed from a scene, that is basically one way to do it. Let's hit play and we'll see if everything's good. So I'm gonna launch a projectile and let's see if it goes away after three seconds. Nope, it didn't, <laughs> okay. So let's check our debugger. Let's see, timer was not added to the scene tree. Ah, okay, right. So in your code, if you're gonna be creating new objects like this, you have to remember to add it somewhere inside of your currently running gameplay scenes. So we could just add it as a child of the projectile, which is perfectly legitimate. So we'll do add child underscore free timer. Now that it exists inside of the scene, it can interact with our other scene objects properly. I'll control shift to D here. So let's go ahead and run our project. And with the add child, it should work now. So we launch an object here. Our projectile is a timer. When that timer expires, the projectile frees itself. And uh, that would be handy because if your game is gonna create 10,000 projectiles, you don't want them all to be permanently in your scene if they didn't happen to collide with anything. So just keep things like that in mind. Basically we have our object cleanup, we can score. Okay, I notice also that uh, we just got two points on that scoring because I think the 
scoring area moved faster than the projectile itself. So that's kind of an interesting interaction. We could leave it there and just say, okay, if the projectile happens to enter the ring twice, then we just score two points. And um, I think that would be legitimate. Another way we could handle it is that when it's a projectile that enters the ring, we just remove the projectile immediately. And I think that might make a little bit more sense for what we originally intended. Uh, or you could keep track of all the projectiles in a array that have already entered the area. And then you check if the projectile that just entered the uh, area already exists in the array and then not allow it to score again. So I think what we'll do for the score box is we'll just remove the projectile. That's probably the simplest. So back in the score box script, after we uh, score the projectile, we'll do uh, body dot Q free. And that should be all we need to do to basically remove the projectile. So in a sense, the projectile hit its target and many projectiles after they hit a target, they would remove themselves. So um, that makes sense. So let's try to score here one more time. Okay, I need to have it charge up a bit more. And we have it score. And then you saw it disappears immediately. And so now basically everything is working as intended. But what I will do is I will increase the power on the charge so that it's easier for it to actually get into the uh, area. So in the projectile launcher script, I'm going to change the time power multiplier and I'm going to make that, let's say 1.0 or for fun, let's say 1.25. And then if we run the scene, then it's going to be a lot quicker to charge up our shot. And that should make it a little bit more fun because we don't have to wait like five seconds between every projectile uh, being shot. So that in a nutshell is how you can code at least a simple game inside of Godot using pure C Sharp and Visual Studio Code in order to achieve what you want. And at the end, I even made a better prototype than I did in the preparation for this tutorial. So I, I think I'm pretty happy with this. So I hope you guys learned a lot in this tutorial. I've been Chris. Thanks for watching all the way to the end. And hopefully I'll see you guys in my future Godot content.